Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's for us often an issue. Uh, I mean, my own mother tongue is, uh, as you can see what I'm stumbling here right now, not English. Um, so I know the feeling it's horrible for me to stand uh, up here as well, although I'm smiling on the outside. Um, no, so thank you very much for everyone who also comes to our booth, um, although uh, speaking English is not their, their daily thing. Okay. So now I would like to go more into detail regarding agriculture technology and see how startups can help to feed the world. So I would like to invite back up on stage um, Cyabox, Amanda and Meta. Thank you so much for coming over from Indonesia. And then I would like to also welcome back on stage Paul from Verificate. And then the moderation will be our very own Rosie Keller. The stage is yours. Hey, hello everyone and welcome to our panel on how startups can feed the world. My name is Rosie Keller and I'm the SeedStars Regional Manager for Asia and I'm very excited to be here talking about such an important topic of how technology can be leveraged to tackle issues like world hunger and especially given the importance of the sector for the Southeast Asian economies that you're active in. Um, so I'm very excited to be here with some of our very inspiring alumni who you've just met. Um, so just as a quick reminder, we have Pao from Verificate uh, who does supply chain verification and Amanda and Metha from Sirebox, um, who connect farmers directly with consumers. So, uh, to start out, I'd be very interested to hear, because I'm always fascinated by these moments where you decide and actually become founders. Um, on a more personal note, what kind of triggered you to be passionate enough to start your respective businesses? Okay, so I think for um, me, because I actually started off um, as a farmer, so it's a typical, um, I had a problem that I, I found and it's, it was something that um, I strongly felt that was a problem that needed to be fixed. Um, so every time I was kind of growing uh, different types of uh, vegetables, I would always have over harvest of something that I didn't know what to do with. And sometimes it'd be about like 20 to 50 kilos of say a kale or a Swiss chard that I, I couldn't sell. So I'd either kind of give it away or um, give it to my family, but that was still too much kale. So I just feed it to that, you know, the animals at the farm. Yeah. Um, so, and then I realized, okay, a lot of farmers in the area are also experiencing the same thing. Uh, they don't know where to sell their produce. Kind of if you, if you have to sell to supermarkets, um, you need to have a company and um, they usually require consignment. And so that's from the farmer side and from the consumer side, um, people are becoming healthier, I feel, these days and they need good access to good quality produce. So uh, as well as initially, we were focusing on organic, which was very, uh, there wasn't any organic produce in Indonesia. Um, so that's what initially uh, led me to found Sayurbox because um, we have so many farmers as well in Indonesia and so many consumers to feed. Yeah, definitely. Do you know by any chance how many kind of farmers you have or what percentage of the... Right now? Yeah, uh, just right, to give us a ballpark. Yeah. So right now we're working with around 100 farmers and suppliers. So we're not going 100% direct to farmers. We do with um, the okay. capacity that we can. Um, so we're still working also with kind of supp suppliers as well. Okay, cool. And Pao, from, from your side, what brought you to join Verificate? So, uh, actually first, I mean, when you go to the supermarket and you look at uh, uh, a product, have you ever <laughs> thought about, like, you, sometimes you have, like, the same product, like, with two different packages, and it has actually, like, a very different price. And sometimes you can look at the labels and you see that they are different. Okay, this one is organic, this one is not organic. Um, where is it actually coming from? Is it safe? Uh, how is produced? So it started everything and more here in Southeast Asia uh, that at least it's quite different from where I come from, uh, from Barcelona. 
So uh, it started like think like getting uh, more like I really wanted to know more about it, and my background is in aquaculture, uh, so even more with fish and shrimps. So where is actually this coming from, and is it safe? And it's when you start digging into, and you see that there is actually a huge gap there that it's very, very difficult to, to know, to get some information from. And it's where then you dig into the supply chains, and you see that there are some supply chains that they're very horizontal. So you can see actually like, you know, like the process and each step and all the stakeholders engage. And other supply chains that are extremely uh, difficult, so it's not something horizontal or vertical that you can just follow right away. And, and this is actually one of the big uh, challenges of the seafood supply chain. Okay, interesting. Do you have any kind of maybe examples of shocking things you found in seafood supply chains in that field that you can could share? Sure. Well, so now as the big picture is that um, farmers are requested to do many, many things. Mm -hmm. So a uh, farmer is requested to do that, to reach this kind of a standard, to invest because they have to change the, the methodology they are using. So usually it requires an, uh, an economical investment. Um, for, so mainly to adapt to regulations. But what is actually what the farmer gets? So the farmer has to put a lot of effort there, but mm -hmm. is it compensated somehow? Who is actually getting the benefit? Is the farmer? So actually there is no balance between, the, between effort and reward in the, in the different stakeholders in the supply chain. So are you actually tracking that? Like you know exactly how much the farmers are, are, are getting? Or well, not. for example, not, not how much they are getting, uh -huh. but for example, just to put a label on it, okay. uh, you need at least around 3,000 US dollars okay. per year per label, for example. But in case of a sh shrimp farming, if you ask them, okay, this, you cannot discharge the water in the canal. Okay. So you need, for example, a recirculating system. That means investment. Mm. They have to build other ponds. They have to stop actually culturing in many ponds because they will have to use them for water treatment. Mm -hmm. So you're actually telling them that you have to reduce the production yeah. within your limited area. And what are they getting actually? Reduced production in that case. So the effort and the rewards are not compensated. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's, yeah, it's one of the main, main challenges in that supply chain. Okay, so, you're, so those are the challenges that they're perhaps facing, but what are the challenges that you guys find are the biggest or the most tough ones to crack because you're both kind of working in making supply chains more equitable and responsible. Yeah, you want to answer that? For us, since we, we are really heavily in like the operational side of the business, um, like we're dealing with local farmers like, from different areas, so one of the, f the, the most prominent problem, especially in Indonesia, is the logistics. So, and, and this is one of the reasons why the farmers back home in Indonesia, they're really dependent on these village traders, you know, the loan sharks and stuff like that, because they're essentially providing them with the access to logistics in order for them to be able to market their harvest. Because sometimes the farmers, they don't have trucks, they don't have like, you know, um, all the, the logistic access to, um, to market their, their harvest. Um, and also the, uh, like the approach to the farmers itself, um, because these loan sharks and village traders, they've been to working together with the farmers for a very, very long period of time, like for decades. Like, um, for example, the fathers of the, the loan sharks, they've been like providing loans and, you know, um, buying the, the, the harvest from these uh, farmers uh, since like, you know, a very long time, like, like yeah, 10 years, 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, like 10 years, 20 years ago, the fathers, um, and then buying also from the, uh, like the, the, the kid, the son of the farmers and stuff like that. So it's like a really generation, um, um, long of uh, relationships and um, and sometimes sometimes it's really difficult to kind of like um, approach the farmers in order to be able to provide them with the other alternatives um, of accessing the market so that's one of the challenge that uh, we currently um, kind of like face currently facing and from your side any uh, anything to from, from what uh, our challenge, the, the challenge that we found uh, is actually related to what I said before about the effort. So it's actually getting information from the farm. So making sure that the farmer is inputting information the, 
uh, in the platform uh, regularly. How do you incentivize that they keep updating their information and that they um, So there are keep it different ways to incentivize it, and I think that we haven't gotten uh, yet the, the perfect formula. Okay. Um, but definitely we are, uh, we actually, uh, we do it different ways. One, it's actually giving them uh, feedback all the time about all the data that they are inputting. So at least they don't pass only from paper to a cloud-based solution, but also they keep having feedback of all that information. So, and also having, giving them the opportunity to have a kind of a farm management tool in the hands. Okay. So for them gives a, a very fast benefit, uh, just like, you know, a very short-term uh, short benefit. So when you see feedback, can you just give us an example of to make it a little bit more tangible of what that concretely... Yes, so in our case, it's yeah. standard benchmarking feedback. Okay. So uh, we can say to the farmers if they are reaching a stand the, the standard or not, and, and what, is, what do they need actually to reach it. So at least they can see they can benchmark among some of the standards. So this is one way to, to incentivize them. So they are interested in putting information and knowing how it's how is going on. And then others is about the farm management tools, so it's more related to production. Yeah, so just in addition to that, so one of the things that, uh, another thing that we find challenging is actually uh, getting the farmers to adopt technology, right? So yes. I, I guess you guys have exactly. uh, been more successful in that than us. So initially we also tried to create kind of a farm management app uh, for these far farmers in order to have continuous supply of the produce, but it was just, it was way too difficult to um, get them to adopt, especially, um, I think in the future maybe it will be a bit easier as time also um, Pr proceeds, you know, but for us, that's been like one of one one of the difficult challenges, I think. Yeah, and, and especially without the strong incentive that uh, to provide with, to the farmers, it's really kind of like difficult to motivate them to use and l really learning to kind of like input all the data into the app. So we, we just tried. said, let's just get the demand first, and they'll yeah. want, they'll come to us once they see kind of okay we can use um, this technology as long as we can sell our, pro our produce, you know, everything can go, um, you know, straight to the consumers. That's right. Actually, like, just checking at that, um, what we have found is that in uh, different supply chains, it's also very different. So in our case, we work mainly in the stream and also in sugarcane. And with the stream farming, generally, like, everyone has their, uh, their, their iPhone, an iPhone 10 or even 11. <laughs> While when you look at the sugarcane, it's not the same case. And we actually had to conduct a survey to know exactly how many people were using smartphones. Uh, so how many farmers were using smartphones. Why do you think that is, smartphones. that discrepancy? Uh, so, well, the, the benefit <laughs> as well, the profit that they do. So it's uh, just totally different worlds with, uh, yeah, with sugarcane and, uh, and shrimp farming. Yeah. So, and also then the age, so who is farming, how old are they, and of course, like, um, like uh, there is a big correlation between age of the farmers and also yeah. using new technologies. So a lot of awareness work to be done, and on both sides, I assume, the producers and consumers. How kind of responsive have the different um, stakeholders been to your, your missions and what you're trying to get done? Uh, <laughs> In terms of consumers, again, I think it's still like uh, a behavior. They're so used to buying. Uh, right now, we're just doing fresh produce online. So we're sell selling online and we're delivering on for next day. Mm -hmm. um, so we feel like whenever we do customer surveys, um, they come back and uh, we kind of ask them, you know, if they don't order again, why is that? And we feel the main uh, reason is just the behavior of uh, kind of ordering fresh produce online. It hasn't yet been um, adopted. And also because our mission is also to, uh, you know, cut the supply chain. Yeah. Whereas actually consumers in uh, Indonesia don't really care about that. They just, you know, they just want um, produce to be fresh. And as well as we are focusing on local produce and a lot of consumers that we were initially targeting, which was very high-end consumers, they um, also want a lot of imported produce. So there's this kind of thing, okay, uh, and then the investors, we have like very high growth investors. Um, yeah. So it's kind of this, like, I would say mission 
differences. Yeah. So, uh, but I mean, that's something that we're also trying to balance out. But again, like if we don't um, get, gain enough traction, if we don't uh, focus on the consumers, uh, we can't, you know, expand the business. And in the end, we won't be helping anyone. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of um, expanding, what are your current plans to scale, if, if any? What, are, what have you got in the works? Um, so like what Meta said in the presentation, um, so every time w like we buy huge bulks from something and we buy uh, directly from the farms, like say the pineapple, we're able to sell this pineapple for a very good price so, and very good quality compared to the wet market um, in Indonesia. So these are like kind of maybe the floating markets in Bangkok, similar to that. Yeah. Um, or even the more bigger markets, you know, the bigger pasar. So we're actually selling for cheaper than that for some of the items. And this right. brings a lot of customers to uh, want to buy from us as well because the quality is good and the price is cheaper. So what we're trying to do in order to scale is to take, um, now we're taking kind of maybe 10 fruits directly from the farm. So we're, we're trying to do this with all our SKUs. So eventually we can, um, you know, scale, uh, scale in that sense, provide cheaper, cheaper and better quality produce for customers and also uh, better uh, fair trade pricing for the farmers. Okay, very cool. And verificate, do you have any yeah, sure. um, plans so to share? So the, um, the way we have developed the, the platform, it's, uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's in a very flexible way. So once you look, for example, in the supply chain of shrimps or, or sugarcane, it might seem extremely different. But at the end, what the things that we are asking to the farmer is, uh, in case of the sugarcane, is maybe how much fertilizer they are putting in the soil, while in the shrimp farming, we will ask how many food are you putting in the, in the pond. So in terms of IT and the structure, it's extremely similar. So this gives us the opportunity to scale fast and move from one commodity to another without almost changing anything in the platform. So it just maybe changing labels, but sharing the same database and being able to analyze the data in the same way. Okay. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so obviously we're here at a, at a startup centric event, but just in case there's anyone who still kind of doubts the, the power of startups and what a small business with just a handful of team members can do. Um, could you share, us, share an example that can make a little bit more tangible how startups can tackle these issues in a more agile or more efficient way than, for example, a, a corporate or an NGO um, who's, for example, also in the business of, of verification and standards? Um, an example that can be a bit more tangible in a sense. Sure, for, for us, because, um, because of our size, our current size, we, we structure our team to be kind of like an agile team <laughs> so, so that we are able to kind of like if we want to try out something, uh, we can do it quickly as, you know, as opposed to um, like having a large team where whenever you want to try out something, you need to kind of like carefully plan everything out and then um, kind of like take time to deploy everything. Um, but in our team, we, we try to kind of like do like this small experimentation over time and then quickly learn from that and then adjust. Um, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's one of the advantages as well of having like a small team. For example, like um, in the case of the app, like initially we started with the farming app that Amanda just mentioned. Um, we thought that would be like the solution that can help the farmers in order to be able to access the market directly. Um, but then when we figure out that they, they still have like a technology barrier, um, like the technology adoption barrier in that, um, in using the app, then we can quickly shift um, like the technology to be the platform that we're using in Cyberbox right now. Mm -hmm. So those kind of exam example of um, how we can kind of like um, test out something, build solution uh, quickly, test test it out, and then get feedback, and then you know moving on to something else. Yeah, experimenting a little bit. Yeah, and I think we also realize as startups like how fast um, the world is changing, right? With technology, everything's changing so fast that so you have to kind of uh, make yourself adapt to the fast pace and the fa fast movement or not you're just going to lose out right yeah. you see china how like they're they're growing so fast and um so we have to make sure we're growing with everyone else and adopting kind of uh everything that everyone else is doing within our ecosystem as well so we need to kind of know our place uh where we are in the ecosystem and taking advantage of everyone yeah. other startups and other uh technologies that are growing with us and making sure we don't get left behind
Yeah, like the yeah, fire yeah, management, that's all that kind of thing. That's right. Um, so, sorry. Um, how are your the the framework conditions that you have, and how can, for example, governments or corporations help you guys out to make your lives easier? <coughs> well, that's a very interesting question, um, and I guess that each one, if it's a corporation or if it's a government or an NGO, works a bit uh, different, or at least in our case, can help us dif very differently. Mm -hmm. So NGOs uh, help us uh, with so. One of the things that we are tackling is the social issues in the farms, right? So NGOs there play uh, a total partnership role um, because we are not a government agency or someone that can actually uh, blame or scold or do something when there is actually a problem in the ground. But yes, NGOs can take care of that. So we totally see NGOs as partners and we totally need them. So that's from one side. Then the government has their own regulations and uh, sometimes are not at farmers' reach, uh, sometimes because of uh, the economy, uh, so economical problems, sometimes uh, because of education, or even just because they, they don't even reach the farm in terms of what they, what they have to do or what the, the market needs. So, and then finally, the, the, the international market, what it's asking for. Uh, we have like international standards that if you want to send things out, if you want to export, you need to uh, get to those standards yeah, first. Yeah, you were saying before, like, there's like 50 or 60 something regulations sometimes are, just for tomatoes. Yeah. yeah, there are many, many different uh, standards for each and one of the different commodities. So there are some that they are very global and general and some very specific. Uh, but I don't know, for organic only, how many standards you know for organic? So natural and one, EcoCert, another one. Um, so the EU organic regulation, another one, so, and for each commodity. And then when you look at the different indicators are actually very similar. So they share more than 70% of the indicators. So when a farmer... Lots of streamlining to be done. <coughs> so at the end, if you are a farmer, what you should do? What should you do? Like, you sh should you go for this standard, for the other one? If you have to pay for each one, uh, yeah, how much can you afford? Okay, and uh, for you guys, very quickly, perhaps, is there anything that these kind of bigger players in the ecosystem can do to support you in uh, what you're what you're trying to do? Um, I think for us, is the um, like the government um, by providing like the, um, the the support towards the ecosystem, like um, everyone in the ecosystem to work to be able to um, to work together in kind of like solving these issues. For example, if um, like in in look local um, Indonesian um, market, um, it's pretty, uh, it still pretty, takes pretty long to, to set up a company yeah. with all the regulations and kind of like um, setting up a new business there. Um, I think if, if, if those can be kind of like tackled first, more businesses that uh, offer the solutions towards a, a certain problem in, in the agriculture supply chain can be kind of like more um, like easily uh, kind of reg registered company yeah, and stuff like that. The it's, kind of basics yes, of that. Yeah, the, ba basics, uh, the basic stuff of, of that. Okay, I just have um, one last question because we're already out of time, but um, I'd be really interested to hear basically what area of the food tech and agri-tech space you guys would like to see disrupted next um, or what kind of trends you guys see coming for this year is our last question of the panel. Well, I think for us uh, it's obviously the space that we're in, um, you Fair know, point. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can be the ones to disrupt kind of the, uh, the long gap between um, farmers, producers and consumers. And I think uh, with like the trend of adoption in uh, mobile and the adoption in technology, I mean, that's uh, very likely that and uh, as well as like the logistics, like some of the challenges in Indonesia at the moment, uh, which actually a lot of startups are tackling if we're we can all like work together to tackle all all this together kind so of the logistics cargo to come to Indonesia. Yeah, tar <laughs> yeah <but> where is it? <laughs> um, I mean logistics payment um, E-commerce if all the startups can work together in order to kind of develop um, Everything together. I think that would yeah. be the best from uh, our side it's actually all the certification process. So uh, I, we, we totally believe that it's going, to, it's going to be a revolution during the next five years. So paying a lot for just one audit, that it's just one snapshot of what is happening in the farm once a year. 
that yeah. doesn't give you actually the reality of what's happening there. It's going to totally change. Uh, and this is like the one million business there that all the certification bodies hold and, and technology will, will totally break it out. It's definitely going to be exciting. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So thank you guys very much for sharing your, your input and, and insights. All the best to you and a, a big thanks to the National Innovation Agency for having us. Um, and to, to Nisha and Paul, of course, for bringing us back. So uh, thanks, everyone. And a big round of applause for, for our startups from thank Indonesia you. and Thailand. Thank you. thank you for having us. Thank you very much.